our entire campaign is focused on making life more affordable. We'll make life really much more affordable. Real action to bring down the cost of living. And make life more affordable for Canadians. When you speak about affordability, we are the only party that will give that. Affordability is one of the top issues in this election campaign, and that's despite what's happening with Canada's economy. Here's the big picture, and it appears to be a rosy one. GDP just grew at its fastest rate since 2017, even outpacing the American economy. Since last year, Canada has pumped out 471,000 jobs, helping drive the jobless rate down to a near four-decade low. But that doesn't mean households are flush with cash. Why? Because although the economy is booming, wages kind of aren't. They've been stubbornly low over the long term. That could be changing though. In July, wage growth reached its highest level in a decade. Households sure need it. They've been swimming in a rising pool of debt. Debt levels took off when interest rates fell to near zero. With borrowing so cheap, many people rushed to buy a home. Now, for every dollar the average Canadian earns, he or she owes $1.77. And that could get worse with rising interest rates. What's more, all that home buying, along with an uptick in foreign ownership, set the real estate market on fire. In Toronto and Vancouver, for example, it now costs well over a million dollars to buy a detached home, unaffordable for most people. The same goes for rent right across the country. Consider a minimum wage worker who logs 40 hours a week. Where could they afford to rent a one bedroom apartment and have enough left over for other expenses? Just three cities, according to one report, and all of them are in Quebec. Then there's the cost of food. The annual amount for the average Canadian family of four is expected to jump by $411 this year to more than $12,000. Leading the increase? The healthy stuff we're supposed to be eating. So as parties compete for your vote, how are they promising to relieve the financial strain so many Canadians are feeling? We're asking that question today on Power and Politics. We've left the studio, as you can see, and we're here instead on the University of Ottawa's campus in front of a live audience. And we're going to begin our show tonight with four candidates. Joining me here, Pam DeMoff is a Liberal candidate. Next to her, Pierre Polyev is a Conservative candidate. Angela McEwen is an NDP candidate. And Angela Keller Herzog is a Green Party candidate. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this special edition of PNP. I really appreciate you being with us. Ms. DeMoff, I'm going to start with you. Your party, along with every party actually represented here, has made a number of very expensive promises in this election so far. Yet, you haven't released any of the independent costing of those, uh, of those promises done by the Parliamentary Budget Officer. Why not? Uh, we will be. We will be releasing a fully costed platform, and the key uh, components of the platform will be costed by the parliamentary budget officer, but it will be fully costed. When will that happen? I don't know. Why not? It will be, be as it's, we haven't released our platform yet. But so, you release m items of it, right? There are well, other parties right. that have, you know, these are big promises. These are, for example, mat leave uh, tax exemptions that would yeah. cost the federal treasury a billion dollars, according to your estimates. Would it not benefit Canadians to have an independent assessment of that so that they can measure the validity of your promises as the campaign proceeds? Well, they are great promises, and I'm really proud of what we promised, and, and we will be costing it. And, you know, we should be talking about those promises that we've made and making life more affordable for, for families and for Canadians and for all Canadians can you and do it both, will be though? can you do both can you can you not talk about the the sure you know, we can and we will but but you're not giving me a timeline right like there is no, a difference but we haven't released and, our full platform and you also yet. won't but you won't also you won't cost the entire platform you're just going to cost yeah, it will have a fully you costed said key platform. items though it will be a fully costed platform so every measure that you announce will be costed by the yeah. PBO but no date I, as I don't I it will be fully costed. Okay, Mr. Polyev, your party has announced a universal tax cut that you say will uh, help families or save them about $850 for the average two-person household. The PBO has independently costed that promise, but says that in the first two years it rolls out, it'll cost the Treasury $7 billion each year, and after that about $6 billion. How are you going to pay for that? Are you going to cut spending, and if so, where? First of all, a correction. Tax cuts don't cost money, they save money. They for people, by, they cost the Treasury right. money. And, and I will tell you how the Treasury will deal with that, but we need to get right on the, the accurate philosophical footing. The money belongs to taxpayers. It does not belong to the government, and we're going to leave more in the pockets of those taxpayers. So how will we deal with it from the uh, lost revenue point of view? Well, first of all, we announced today we're going to cut $1.5 billion of corporate welfare. These are grants that favor wealthy executives, shareholders, and foreign companies, of which there have been tens of billions 
announced by this current government. That's just one example. Secondly, $1.5 billion to, dollars of So 14. yes, and we're going to slow the growth of government spending. Uh, the last several years, revenues have been growing by $20 billion a year. And Justin Trudeau has blown every penny. If he'd, slown, if he'd slowed down the growth of his spending, the revenue from taxpayers would have been able to catch up and we would have been able to phase out so, the deficit. So if we slow the growth, down the growth I take your point. Slowing spending, the growth of spending equals cuts, though. Where will those cuts come no, from? No, it does not, actually. See, slow, cut, cuts means reducing the actual budget. Slowing the growth means maintaining current budgets while slowing the pace at which those budgets grow. Yeah, but there are, for example, in uh, healthcare, there are, the, as the population grows, the, the, the amount of money needed to fund it grows as well. So if you cut that, if you slow that, it doesn't match the population growth of the population's needs, and that amounts to a cut. Well, healthcare is about 15 or 20 percent of the federal government's budget. There's much more that it, beyond that uh, that has been growing at an unexpected, acceptable rate. And I'll give you some examples of areas that we will be in Give me one if you our, don't mind. Sure. Yeah. March yeah. Madness. March Madness is when managers and ministers in the government get to the end of the year and realize they have budget left over, so they blow every penny before the money expires. And we see it all across the city. This is not the way you properly manage government spending. And that's one of the reasons why government, in fact, in the most recent year, the Liberals almost balanced the budget in the first 11 months. And they went, ran a colossal deficit in the 12th month, because they shoveled all the money out the door. Well, a lot the of that. We are going, oh, okay, to, tackle, point, we are going to tackle March Madness. So that's a second example. Okay, we don't know where example. all that money is going. Some of it could be going to infrastructure. Right. You're no. assuming that it's all waste. But I, I take your point. i got to move on to Ms. McEwen, Thank because you. your, your party is also making an expensive promise, a number of them. But let me zone in on pharmacare. The last report that was done for the federal government on that, government rather, on that said that it would come at a $15 billion cost. I know that your party makes the point that it will save money in the long run, but it will still, again, cost some government $15 billion. Would that cost be shared with the provinces, and how much would you expect the provinces to pay? Yes, I think all of the plans, because some of the savings will accrue to the provinces, right? So you expect them to put the, what they're going to be saving into the plan to implement universal pharmacare. Will that mean that they have the option to opt out? No. So you're going to force provinces to come up with they're more gonna, money to participate want to. in this? No, no, not more money, because they're saving money by imp doing but, it. So but, they'll end but up But there have already been a money. number of premiers, including the Premier of Ontario, the Premier of Quebec, who have both expressed concern about being forced to commit to a system that they don't, perhaps for whatever reason, feel is necessary, and then pony up cash. Right, but they haven't actually sat down with us and worked out the details. So when they sit down and work out the details and see how much money this is going to save them, see how this lowers the strain on hospitals and doctors and operating rooms. When people can afford to take their blood pressure medication, they don't have a stroke and come into the hospital and into the emergency room, right? So if you're doing the preventative care, if you have that up front, it reduces the strain, and I think provinces are going to be more than willing to come on board when they see has your party, how that's going to work. Has your party figured out what the cost sharing will be? Will the, will the federal government pay 50% and provinces be expected to pay the rest, or how will that No, work? I think you'd have to sit down and work that out with the provinces, right? So that would be individual based on the province, or just provinces writ large? I think we'd do the same thing we did with CPP, where you get all of the provinces together and you sit down and you hammer out a deal with the provinces. And one follow-up question, just on the breadth of your promises. I noticed a couple of reporters who were on the tour today with Mr. Singh. There have been a lot of questions about, uh, for example, today the promise was dental care, and I think it was $860 million a year that it was cost out of. Where, how will that be paid for? And he hasn't, I think the exact quote he said, he says it will involve better choices than the Trudeau government, but he gave no specifics. What is a specific way that your, the NDP would intend to pay for the type of promises that you have made? Right. So budgets are about choices, right? That's the whole thing. And I've, I've been involved in 12 alternative budgets with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, which is about putting different choices out there. And that's what the NDP platform is. We've put out the different choices that we're going to make. We're going to tax the rich more. We are going to, if your household has wealth valued at over $20 million, we're going to tax the wealth over that amount at 1%. So we're asking the 0.01% to pay 1% more. And how much taxes. will that raise? That then? will raise six. Uh, the PBO put out the estimate. Mm -hmm. It would raise almost $6 billion in the first year. And the rich are getting richer so fast that that will rise to $10 billion a year very quickly. So that just covers 
you know, a two thirds of PharmaCare. That's one yeah, promise. So that's that you've one made. promise. That's not a lot. And then the PBOs also put out a report about tax havens that there's twenty five billion dollars of revenue that s- goes missing. You have to spend a lot of money, as we've seen from the previous government, in order to recoup that money. But not a lot in terms of billions. If you put half, if you put a hundred million dollars into staff, you would get half of that billions of dollars back, right? And then we're also talking well, we've heard about that from increasing. The liberals and it didn't happen. Yeah, the liberals are friends with the people who put their money in tax havens, and so are the conservatives. So that's why the, the new Democrats, who are working class, we're going to actually get this done. Okay. Because ha- we're in it for you. I ha- uh, <laughs> I've heard that slogan before. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Keller Hertz- Herzog, rather, I, I want to move on to you. Uh, a very similar question. Your party makes a number of expensive promises. One that jumped out at me was the guaranteed basic income. Uh, I know, again, that, the, that your party has put out the justification for that, the proposed merits of that. But one independent estimate put the cost of that at $78 billion a year. You have yet, as well, well, though Elizabeth May promised us to release independent costing, you have not yet costed the platform. What are you going to do to pay for that? Okay, we're going to see the uh, cost of the platform very soon, I'm hopeful. What's very soon? Um, I, I'm expecting it in a week, um, okay. and I'm, I'm very keen, like you, to see it, <laughs> like everyone. Um, in terms of the guaranteed living income, what we have right now is a patchwork of um, social support and assistance and income programs. And it's a patchwork that is having people fall between, fall through the cracks. So what a guaranteed living income or universal basic income, as it's also known, will do is provide a floor that every single Canadian can stand on so that every single Canadian can live in dignity and, and have the basics covered. I in terms of where yeah. the money's coming yeah. from, which was your question, it's very clear that before you can transform a patchwork of programs into uh, a universal program that is going to take significant, again, federal, provincial um, negotiations. And, so you and expect the provinces to help play for that, pay for that? I think that if the provinces see that it's in their interest to have a very simplified administrative structure, and they're going to have to, and they're going to have significant savings. It's going to be in their interest. So, yes. for example, in Ontario right now, in the past, I think eight months, the there, there was a pilot program under the past government on guaranteed basic income. It was cancelled by the current government. How would you convince them that all of a sudden they decided that wasn't in their interest, but they will start paying money uh, to the federal government for it? I think that money talks, right? And at a certain point, if you're stacking up the cost of the status quo against uh, future possibilities if we work together. And and the Greens really do have an idea of doing politics differently and having people work together. Um, we think that parliamentary committees, collaboration across parties, pooling our good ideas will take Canada I respect, forward. Yeah, I respect that. I just think that we've seen the example of federal provincial relations over the last year, and it's not always as easy as it sounds, right? I think that once the dollars and cents are stacked on the table and we can see what makes sense in, in big numbers, I think that it'll be fairly easy to find ways to simplify and yet keep voters, because provincial governments want to get reelected too, um, and, and have the services there for people. Okay, I have just a few minutes left and I'm going to do something a bit different this time because we do have this lovely studio audience here. Uh, I'd like to give each of you 30 seconds to make your pitch to the students sitting here what is one thing that you would do to make their life a little bit better? Ms. DeMoff, I'll start with you. Well, I, I, as I look at the students, I don't think anyone's been impacted more, or you're certainly impacted by conservative cuts we've seen in Ontario. And there's a big difference between liberals and conservatives. Conservatives see costs, we see investments. We've invested in post-secondary school education through Canada summer jobs, or Can- Canada summer jobs, Canada student loans. We've extended the repayment. I think you need to, we cannot afford another uh, conservative government. In, it, we've seen on what's happened in Ontario. We can't let that happen across the country. We're moving forward to make sure that all Canadians get ahead, not just a select few. Mr. Polyev, your turn. What we have seen in Ontario is the previous Liberal government that racked up so much debt that we're spending a billion dollars a month paying off wealthy bondholders and bankers in interest on that debt. What Conservatives offer is to leave more money in your pocket to let you get ahead. So your hard work, your initiative, and your efforts can build the future that you want, rather than what all these other parties are promising, which is to take your money away and promise you that they will give it back bigger than, than it was when it started. 
We believe in leaving it in your pocket in the first place so that our workers and entrepreneurs can build a dynamic, dynamic economy in which you get ahead. Ms. McEwen, your turn. I think Mr. Polyev misunderstands the importance of public services. All of you are here at a university being taught by public servants. And if you had to go out and find somebody to teach you this stuff by yourself, it would cost you a whole heck of a lot more than what you're paying now. So that's why you can take taxes where we're gonna tax the rich, and then you can pay for recreation centers, you can pay for schools, you can pay for buses, and it costs a lot less than it costs for each of you to buy a car and drive to school. So when we pool our resources, when we chip in, when tax rates are fair, we're all better off. And there's more money in our pockets then. What Mr. Uh, Polyam's party wants okay. to do is give tax cuts to people who are already rich and hope that you don't That's understand that it's not going to help you. <laughs> Final word goes to Ms. Keller Herzog. Thank you. I'm going to talk about education. The Green Party thinks that investing in education is investing in the future, in the public good. So we would have free tuition for tertiary level education as well as colleges. But we also think that what's the point in, ed in investing in education if the planet's on fire? So we're also going to look after the carbon budget so that you can get your education, we can get the climate emergency braked and under control, and the planet and the people can have a good future. Okay, I have to leave it there. I want to thank all four of you very much for making time for us and for the audience here this evening. Thanks to Angela Keller Herzog, Angela McEwen, Pam Demoff, and Pierre Polyev. For the first eight days of this race, billions of dollars in promises have been made that are, say, they say at least, to help people manage your day-to-day -day expenses. Here's a few of them. The Liberals want to expand one of their own initiatives, the first-time home buyer incentive aimed at helping millennials buy their first home. The Conservatives have promised what they call a universal tax cut. It essentially targets all Canadians who pay income tax. The NDP says they would crack down on what Canadians pay for cell phones and internet by implementing a price cap and requiring that service providers offer basic affordable plans. Finally, the Greens are offering up, as we heard just a little while ago, free tuition for post-secondary students. So which of these promises are the most feasible? How much will they add to the deficit or will they force cuts? Kevin Page is the president and CEO of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy here at the University of Ottawa. And Mustafa Askari is the Institute's chief economist. Hello to both of you. Wonderful to see you. I wanted to start off by asking you about what we're zoning in on on this show, and that is this sort of discrepancy between what we read in the headlines, which is that the economy is doing amazingly well, and then the sense that a lot of people have that it is really afford unaffordable to sort of function, to buy a home, to pay rent, to buy food. What is driving that discrepancy, Mr. Ascari? I'll start with you. Well, I mean, certainly what we have, what we have seen is that Overall, the economy is doing well. But the question is that how is that going to reach everybody in the, in the economy? Certainly, we have, we have seen that at the lower level of income, people are not benefiting from some, some of that growth uh, as well as the higher level income. So that creates anxiety. I mean, there are, and also there, there's sort of the news in terms of uncertainty globally, and that people are afraid that there will be another recession. And people are talking about it, whether that's going to happen or not, it's not clear. But but those kind of things actually create problems for people and uncertainty and anxiety because they're afraid that they're going to lose their job or they're going to lose their home. Uh, so, I mean, it is natural in this kind, of, uh, this kind of environment that people are worried about it. And we have seen issues with the distribution of income in Canada, which, which obviously affects a lot of people. So, I mean, I can understand that, you know, when, when you look at the housing prices, for, for example, and, and especially in some urban areas where people have extremely, it's extremely difficult for them to, to be able to buy a, buy a home, it, it, it affects them. It, 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 it's, an, it's an issue. And what the solution is an issue, you know, something that obviously our politicians have, have, to, have to deal with and have to address. Okay, let me talk about those solutions. Mr. Page, I want to start off with a promise. I think we're going to start with the Liberals. And um, we have, a, a, I think, a board that shows what this promise is. But it's expanding. And this is just what we were speaking about, this idea that especially in large urban centers, it's really hard to even think of buying a house. I'm 38 years old. I just bought my first one. Uh, they expanded the first-time homebuyer incentive. 
it, 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 and the, the promise is essentially that you can get some money from the government, interest-free, but you have to give it back when you sell your house. So whatever stake of the, you know, whatever percentage of the equity you have to give back, if it's worth more, if it's worth less, does that is that effective? Well, if, if you're a first-time home buyer, it's you know, got to be a very appealing program, and um, it's kind of one of the few really innovative programs where we're talking about using government in a different way, like to have the Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation take a, almost an equity interest in the house. Um, yeah, again, is it going to solve the fact that we've seen this incredible price escalation in Vancouver or Toronto, and will it solve the, the, the next problem? No, it's not going to deal with that kind of on a structural basis. But certainly for first-time home buyers, and you know, there's going to be a lot of folks out here. They're going to be looking for that first-time house, home uh, purchase in you know the next five, ten years. So yeah, it's going to make a difference for sure. Take some stress off. Mr. Ascari, what about the Conservatives' promise on a universal tax cut? So this is reducing the rate on the lowest income bracket by 1.25 percent, progressively over a number of years. Well, it's a, this is a big tax cut. And in terms of the dollar amount that is gonna, going to reduce the revenue of the government, it's close to $6 billion. The amount that people will get, the maximum is about $400 per person, if you are, if you are making income above $60,000, $65,000 a year. So I guess the question one has to ask is, how, how could you use that kind of money for other purposes? Because you know, tax cut is a tax cut, it's very clear, everybody knows that, you know, almost everybody will get that uh, some money, including myself, including Kevin, and including yourself. The issue is that that $400 is something that, do I need that $400, I and mean, can, it, can it be used for something else? I mean, that's really the issue. And policy making is really about trade-offs and how you use the, you use the resources that you have. We haven't seen yet how the, how the party is going to actually fund that. Uh, once we see that, then we can actually see, okay, well, the, the, is, there, is there going to be a net benefit for individuals? Right. Yeah, Mr. Page. Yeah. But actually, just the, the issue of trade-offs is, I think that's, what, you know, it's an important one. And, like, what is $6 billion? So, you know, again, as Dr. Scary said, it's, he could, we could put it in dollar terms, what it, how much more money we'll put in, into our wallets. But I think in terms of public services, like, $6 billion is a lot of money. Like, if we go to the public accounts, what does the Department of Fisheries and Oceans spend? The whole department, the Coast Guard, Fisheries Management, it's $2.5 billion. If we go to the Department of Agriculture, they run farm stabilization programs, they do food safety, marketing, et cetera, another $2.5 billion. So to find $6 billion, you literally have to wipe out two departments. And so, like, I think when... when and, and the question can almost be posed to every party. Like, there, yes, there are, every single party has promised now in the billions of promises without saying either how much are we going to increase the deficit or what are we going to cut spending by? It should be posed to every party, absolutely. And, again, what we heard today, we, we started to see some of the, you know, maybe a, a tipping point. One of the parties, the Conservative Party, saying we'll find another... One and a half billion dollars a year in corporate savings, mm -hmm. Mr. Polyev said that. But again, if you look at the math around one and a half billion, like if you look at what we government spends on corporations, the whole department, the whole industry portfolio is maybe upwards of seven billion dollars. Most of that wouldn't be available. The entire tax expenditures, which largely wouldn't be available, small business tax credit, et cetera, like it's maybe another ten billion dollars. So one and a half billion a year, actually, off you know, relatively narrow portfolio, was probably three, four billion dollars. That's a massive amount of savings to find. So again. What's the program? Like, what's the base of spending you're going to find? The, yeah, and they they would say that they're going to review essentially what government gives business, and then come up uh, come up with that savings that way. That's that, that's what they said today. But however, we don't know what that review will consist of or what the bar will be. That kind of thing. I do want to move on to test the other uh, promises. The NDP will put a price cap on cell phone and internet services, introduce a telecom consumers bill of rights, and require service providers to offer basic plans and affordable unlimited data plans for cell phones. Will that actually make my cell phone bill cheaper? And I will say that, uh, you know, the industry says actually prices over, over the last uh, number of years, between 2016 and 18, have gone down 35% in this country. That's the, hard, the, that's the really hard one to, to judge right now, exactly, see how that's going to work and how much that's going to reduce the, the cost for individual people. Because obviously, I mean, the, the, the companies probably have, have other ways of, of raising fees and, and Company have a, have a sort of offset those impact. 
So I don't know, and, and we have to really to see how, how these cost it and how much it's going to cost in general for, for the government to do that. Okay. And finally, the Green Party, Mr. Page, a, a, a promise aimed very directly at this audience, the idea of free tuition. They say, according to the platform, the abolition of tuition fees would be financed by redirecting existing spending on bursaries and tuition tax credits, savings from administering the student loan system, and the hundreds of millions of dollars in defaults written off every year. Does that add up to you? Yeah, I'm going to need to see the details. Mm -hmm. That's uh, when we start in, in when we start seeing. In perhaps it's next week, as the Green Party member said. Like, like this is a billion. University of Ottawa, forty thousand students. It's a billion dollar enterprise. Just our university, and you know, most of the revenues come from students. Mm -hmm. So, does this is this going to be fundable? And I know the Green Party is talking about a balanced budget over the next five years, you know, assuming we get the economic assumptions that the PBO says. Like, again, we need to see the details. That one's, that, I don't know that that adds up either. Yeah, I'm dying to see all those details. I have just a really quick question, we do have to go, but there's some controversy right now around whether or not each party should be giving out the independent costing that the PBO uh, offers. You've occupied that role, what do you think? Should, should each party be releasing those promises as they come out? You can both weigh in. Well, I mean, the timing of release is not really something you, know, you, you can force the parties to do it. They have to make that decision on their own in terms of you know, what would be the most effective way of releasing those. But, but getting those uh, measures costed by PBO, I think, is, is absolutely essential. Uh, I think we have, we have put together a framework to, to score the, the political parties' uh, um, the platform on fiscal credibility. And one of our criteria is that the, the measures have to be costed by by the PBO. It's just to, to give people a confidence that those numbers are actually, you know, they're, they're the good Legit. numbers that you can actually <laughs> rely on them. You have confidence in them. They're not, uh, they're not biased in any way. So, so it is important. The timing, I don't think is that important. Eventually, everybody is going to release their platform and we can, we can see exactly what they have. Mr. Page, final word to you. Just have a few moments. I, just, I need to say something nice about the Conservatives. So, um, <laughs> you know, I just think they're doing a great job in terms of how they're releasing this information. We're getting an announcement from the leader, we're getting a press release, we're getting a backgrounder, and we're getting the PBO report. That's a good standard if for all parties. And you know, thinking about this in terms of maybe the next election, it could be four years away, it could be a year or two away, we could be back doing this depending if we get a minority parliament. I think they're doing it right, but I guess as Dr. Scary said, if we get it later, that's also okay too. We're way better off getting the PBO. We're very proud of the PBO. Okay, I imagine. Thank you very much to both of you. Hope that we can have you back later in the campaign to assess those platforms once they all are finally out and costed. Thank you very much to Mustafa Askari and Kevin Page. Hi, I'm Vashi Capellos, host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video. Thanks for watching. <laughs>